Admiral King had set the new deadline. In early July, the Joint Chiefs had received a report from Admiral Gormley and General MacArthur stating, It is our joint opinion, arrived at independently and confirmed after discussion, that the initiation of this operation at this time, without reasonable assurance of an adequate air cover during each phase, would be attended with the gravest risk. It is recommended that this operation be deferred pending the further development of forces in the South Pacific and Southwest Pacific areas. King read the dispatch and snorted to General Marshall. Three weeks ago, MacArthur stated that if he could be furnished amphibious forces and two carriers, he could push right through to Rabaul. He now feels that he not only cannot undertake this extended operation, but also not even the Tulagi operations. Unimpressed, Admiral King replied, Execute. But then, after General Vandegrift had made it clear that he could not possibly invade by August 1st, King agreed to a three-day postponement. After Gormley and Vandegrift protested anew, he added three more days of grace. But that was it. It had to be August 7th. Coastwatcher reports and reconnaissance flights of Army B-17S indicated that the airfield on Guadalcanal was nearly completed. To invade in the face of land-based air would be far too dangerous. And so Archer Vandergrift went grimly ahead with the invasion which his staff was already calling Operation Shoestring. The area Vandergrift hoped to seize centred around the airfield and ran about ten miles along the mid-northern coast and perhaps three miles inland. On its west, according to the details of an old marine chart, was the Longa River, and on the east was the ILU River. Vandergrift had learned from Martin Clemens that this area was defended by from 2,000 to 10,000 Japanese, a disturbingly loose estimate, and that there was a lesser force on Tulagi and Gavutu Tanambogo. Clemens had also reported that there were enemy guns emplaced on the beaches west of the Lunga, and so Vandergrift decided to land on the unprotected beaches east of the ILU. The landings on Tulagi were to be made on its open western end, while the twin islets of Gavututanambogo, being so small and well fortified, would simply have to be stormed. Guadalcanal, of course, was to require the bulk of Vandergrift's forces, and it was still the biggest worry. Information on the island's terrain consisted of that old marine chart, a few faded photographs made by missionaries five years before the Japanese landed, and a short story by Jack London, as well as London's personal anathema upon the entire group. If I were asking, the worst punishment I could inflict on my enemies would be to banish them to the Solomons. On second thought, king or no king, I don't think I'd have the heart to do it. To supplement this unspectacular horde, Vandergrift sent Lieutenant Colonel Frank Goetger flying to Australia. Goetger conferred with Commander Felt and his hard-bitten islanders. He brought back some helpful information on the target area's terrain, as well as eight islanders who had lived on Tulagi or Guadalcanal. The islanders, whose elephantine thirst made the purchase of Scotch whisky an acceptable military expense, were interrogated almost daily. Some of their information proved invaluable. Some, just because it was thought to be invaluable, was to prove costly. One day, General Vandergrift called for a plantation manager who had lived near Red Beach, the designated landing zone on Guadalcanal. Vandergrift pointed to the ILU River on his chart and inquired about the river's characteristics. Since this is the dry season, the islander said, you will have no trouble in fording it. It won't be an obstacle? No, it will not be an obstacle. It would be an obstacle because it was raining this dry season, and because the river was not the ILU but the Teneru. And because of this assurance, General Vandergrift would leave valuable bridging equipment behind. Meanwhile, all other attempts to map Guadalcanal were meeting similar frustration. Although the Army's 648th Engineer Topographic Battalion had obligingly put on a Red Rush aerial photo mapping of the island, a naval transportation officer saw to it that the finished mosaic was carefully filed at the bottom of a mounting pile of boxes in an Auckland warehouse. Vandergrift never got it, nor did he get much help from Lieutenant Colonel Twining, who, with Major William McKean, had boarded a flying fortress at Port Moresby and flown over Guadalcanal. The plane had been jumped by three float zeros over Tulagi Harbour, and Twining and McKean had understandably been more engrossed in the ensuing air battle than in Guadalcanal. They remained thus preoccupied while the fort's gunners sent two zeros spinning down in flames and fought off the pursuit of the third. 
after the big bomber finally got back to Moresby, coming in with bone-dry tanks. All that Twining and McKean could tell Vandergrift was that the landing beaches he had selected seemed suitable. Still desperate for terrain intelligence, the General asked Admiral Gormley to approve landing a scouting party by submarine, but Gormley replied that this was too dangerous. In the end, the opening of the American counter-offensive against Japan was to be based on a map so sketchy that Archer Vandergrift might have been landing on the moon. During the landings, Vandergrift naturally expected the support of carrier-based aircraft, but after that, who would fly from the airfield which Admiral King wanted so badly? The choice fell upon Marine Air Group 23 two squadrons of fighters and two of dive bombers commanded by Colonel William Wallace. But this outfit was then back in Hawaii, checking out on carrier landings and takeoffs. No one seemed to know how such short-range aircraft were to cross thousands of miles of water to Guadalcanal. Supply was another headache. The ships could be loaded only with items actually required to live and fight. Sea bags, bedrolls, tentage hardly articles of luxury had to be left behind. Considerable heavy equipment and motor transport was hauled off the ships and placed in storage. Bulk supply fuel, lubricants, rations was cut to 60 days. Ammunition was reduced from 15 to 10 days of fire, and so the work of unloading and sorting and combat loading went forward in those cold, drenching rains. Wellington's spacious Aotea Key was turned into an ankle-deep marsh of tons upon tons of cereal, cigarettes, candy and little cans of sea rations, whatever had spilled out of sodden and burst containers, and had been churned into a pulpy mass by the feet of thousands of toiling marines, or the wheels of flat-bedded New Zealand lorries laboriously crawling through drifts of cornflakes. Here was Bedlam made more chaotic by the sense of urgency energising all those scurrying men in tan helmets and brown ponchos, made more nightmarish by wharf lights glowing ghostly throughout mackerel day and streaming night, and more lunatic by the sound of rain striking steel decks to counterpoint, with the monotony of a monstrous metronome, the whining of winches, the shouting of boatswain's mates, and the crying of marines warning one another of huge hooks swinging free or of trucks slung in cargo nets like toys, rising from the holds with dangerous rapidity and falling too quickly toward the dock. There were curses, too, yells of frustration whenever marines stumbled over sea ration cans embedded in the mess, or sharp cries of pain uttered by men tearing their flesh on rolls of barbed wire. God almighty damn, what in hell we need barbed wire for? I thought we were going on manoeuvres. That was what they had been told. It was a necessary security precaution, and might also preclude against any of the unvaliant missing the outgoing ships. No leave was granted, of course, but almost all of the men managed to slip into Wellington to promenade the city's quaint, steep streets, to dance with New Zealand girls, to eat steak and eggs, or to savour such exotic potions as rum and raspberry or gin and lemon. And as the rains continued, and order came marvellously out of chaos, General van der Grieffelt alerted the first marines to stand by to transship upon arrival. Clifton Cates commanded the first marines. He was a man as trim as a whiplash, as suave as steel in his breeches and puttees and sun helmet, puffing calmly on a long cigarette holder with which he sometimes punctuated orders given in a pleasant Tennessee drawl. Colonel Cates was an old China hand who had fought in France in World War I. He had been wounded twice, gassed once, and had won seven medals for bravery. Having commanded a platoon, a company, and a battalion in battle, he now had this regiment, and he was both worried and enraged about it. Colonel Cates was enraged because the ship John Erickson, carrying most of his men, was little better than an African slaver. If Cates had had the power, he would have put the ship's owner and her master in their own brig, and let them rot on what they fed the troops, spoiled meat, rancid butter, and rotten eggs without an ounce of fresh food. John Erickson stank like a floating head. Hundreds of nauseated men thronged her leeward rails, and those who could not retch over the side vomited into their steel battle helmets. The heads below decks reeked like open cesspools. Men devoured by dysentery waited outside the heads in long lines. Men who could not get to them in time also used their helmets. The war was just beginning, and the profiteer was already battening on American misery like a leech sucking blood. The worries which nagged Colonel Cates were of a less infuriating nature. He was concerned that the men might be going stale. 
From San Francisco to Wellington was a voyage of about three weeks, and that was time enough to soften muscles only recently hardened by a few months of training. The men were idle and bored. Either they played cards or lounged on top of covered hatches, sunning themselves and batting the breeze, or they lined the gunnels to watch the flying fish, or stare vacantly into white wakes boiling off the fantails, their minds thousands of miles eastward among the scenes of childhood. On some of the less crowded ships it was possible to organise calisthenics, and aboard the George E. Elliot, the men of Cates's 2nd Battalion held boxing matches. Indian Johnny Rivers was frequently in the ring. He sparred lightly with his opponents, careful not to hit them too hard. But one day, as the convoy and its escort of circling warships ploughed through the Blue Pacific, Johnny Rivers heard his friend Al Schmid yelling, You're right, Johnny! Use your right! Rivers swung his right. His opponent stiffened and his eyes became glassy and his knees buckled. Rivers came back to his corner, ruefully shaking his head. What's the idea, Smitty? I didn't want to hit him with my right. Then the irrepressible Rivers grinned. Boy, I sure hit him though, didn't I? So the men of the First Marines sailed on toward New Zealand, and far behind them came the men of the Second Marines, under the formidable protection of the aircraft carrier Wasp. This great ship, which Winston Churchill had hailed as the saviour of Malta, had been rushed from the Atlantic to the Pacific, to escort this borrowed regiment to the First Marine Division's rendezvous area in the Fijis. Admiral Frank Jack Fletcher had sorted from Hawaii. His ships included carriers Saratoga and Enterprise, battleship North Carolina, one light and five heavy cruisers, 16 destroyers and three oilers. After he had rendezvoused with Wasp and all the other warships and transports then at sea or in New Zealand, the force would number 89 ships and 19,000 United States Marines. It would be the greatest invasion fleet yet assembled, but Admiral Fletcher was not jubilant. He was thinking of the three carriers, all that America had in the Pacific, and how dangerous it would be to risk them in the narrow and uncharted waters of the Solomons. Admiral Fletcher did not like this operation at all. Back at Pearl Harbor he had openly predicted that it would be a failure. He had had nothing to do with planning it. In such high hopes did Admiral Frank Jack Fletcher put out for the Fijis to take command of the entire expeditionary force. Beneath Fletcher in the chain of command was Vice Admiral Richmond Kelly Turner. He was a planner and perfectionist, Kelly Turner, a man of beetling brows and rimless glasses, of ferocious language and a tongue as caustic as a shaving stick. He was a leader so pedantic that he would not hesitate to tell a coxswain how to beach his boat. This was the Admiral who was to command the amphibious force, and Major General Vandergrift who commanded only the landing force. That is, the 19,000 Marines who were to seize the objectives, soon found that this was also a sailor who often mistook his sextant for a soldier's baton. Of this, Van de Grift was made aware on July 18th, when a few days after the 1st Marines had arrived in Wellington, Turner's flagship, Macaulay, sailed into the harbour and broke out the Admiral's two-star flag. Turner quickly told Van de Grift that he was keeping all but one battalion of the 2nd Marines for the seizure of unoccupied Ndeni in the Santa Cruz Islands, east of the Solomons. Vandergrift replied that this was to be only a later phase of the operation, and that he was counting on the 2nd Marines for his reserve. If he could not have them, he said, then he would have to change his plans. The meeting ended on a note of impasse. Four days later, July 22nd, Vandergrift and his Marines stood majestically out to sea, bound for the Fiji Islands. On July 26th, the top American commanders met, Turner and Vandergrift risked a heavy sea to transfer from Macaulay to the destroyer Dewey. Already aboard Dewey were Rear Admiral John S. McCain, who commanded all of Admiral Gormley's aircraft in the South Pacific, Lieutenant Colonel Twining, and Colonel Laverne Saunders, commander of the Army Air Force's Flying Fortresses. Dewey made for Saratoga, Fletcher's flagship, and came about beneath its towering beam. Admiral McCain seized a Jacob's ladder and started up, a garbage chute swung open, and the little admiral was showered with milk. It was an infuriating beginning for telling an unfriendly conference. Archer Vandergrift, who had once been startled to see the unruffled Gormley acting like a drill sergeant, was now amazed to see that Fletcher looked tired and nervous, and he put it down to the admiral's recent battles of the Coral Sea and Midway. 
Next, he was surprised to learn that Fletcher had neither knowledge of nor interest in the Guadalcanal operation. Finally, he was thunderstruck to hear him saying frankly that it would not succeed. Then Admiral Fletcher turned on Admiral Turner and angrily accused him of instigating the Solomon's invasion. Unimpressed by Turner's indignant denial, Fletcher interrupted him to ask, How many days will it take to unload the troops? Five, Turner replied. Fletcher shook his head stubbornly. Two days, he said, were quite enough. He would not risk his carriers any longer. Vandergrift struggled to control himself. He tried to explain that this was no mere hit-and-run operation. This was an expedition to take and to hold fortified enemy islands. He, Vandergrift, commanded a heavily reinforced division. There was going to be a fight. His marines would need air cover. Even five days of air cover was scarcely sufficient. Two was suicidal. Admiral Turner agreed, with heat and with force. Admiral Frank Jack Fletcher shook his head. He was leaving with his carriers on the third day. The conference is dismissed, he said curtly. The commanders arose. With them was Vice Admiral Daniel Callaghan, Chief of Staff to Admiral Gormley. He had been present at the entire conference and had taken notes on what was said. But he represented the Admiral who commanded the entire area, as well as this first American counter-offensive, and he never said a word. Two days later, the 1st Marine Division attempted to practice landings on the beaches of Coro Island. In full battle gear, the men scrambled down the cargo nets into waiting Higgins boats to form in a circle, then to go monotonously circling, 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 and to sail back to their ships and clamber back up the nets to return to their holds. The manoeuvres were a fiasco. Sharp offshore coral prevented many boats from landing on the designated beaches, other boats broke down, the naval gunfire was inaccurate and the dive bombers missed their targets. But Admiral Turner and General Vandergrift, who had begun to respect each other and who were both optimists in battle, agreed that at least the defects had shown up early and there would be time to rectify them. A poor rehearsal, they said, means a good show. On the last day of July there was frustration of an entirely different order. Marine officers from Wellington had flown in and they brought with them copies of the July 4th edition of the Wellington Dominion, which said, Hope of coming us. Thrust South Pacific Marines intensified raids in North New York, July 2nd. Operations to seize Japanese-held bases such as Rabaul, Wake Island and Tulagi are advocated by the military writer of the New York Herald Tribune, Major Elliott. One of the signs which suggest that the Allies may be getting ready to capitalise on the naval advantage gained on the Coral Sea and Midway battles is the recent American bombing of Wake Island, he says. The other signs include the intensified raids on the Timor and New Guinea areas. What is needed is to drive the Japanese out of their positions and convert them to our own use. The only way to take positions such as Rabaul, Wake Island and Tulagi is to land troops to take physical possession of them. The newspaper New York Times adds, It may also be significant that the censor passed the news of the arrival of the completely equipped expeditionary force of American Marines at a South Pacific port recently, as Marines are not usually sent to bases where action is not expected. Nor were Marines allowed to mention so much as a bathing suit in their letters home, so strict was their division's security. And yet the chief of censors had presumed to permit newspapers to publish their whereabouts, and columnists had not scrupled to pinpoint their destination, for both the Japanese and the people down under found the name Tulagi synonymous with Solomon Islands. The disclosure was not treachery, of course, it was only stupidity, which is sometimes more destructive. Filled with futile fury, the Marines could only curse the caprice of the free press they would soon be defending. That evening, the sun sank into the sea ahead of them like a dull red disc. Looks like a Jap meatball, said Private Lou Jurgens, one of the Marines aboard Elliot. It's symbolic, the young private called Lucky said sententiously. It's the setting of the rising sun. Ah, shut up, Jurgens growled. Trouble with you, Lucky. You read too many books. Then the ships upped anchor and sailed away. Lieutenant General Haruyoshi Hyakutake arrived at Rabaul on July 24th and was immediately greeted by good news from New Guinea. Troops landed at Buna had pressed into the Owen Stanleys to scout for passable mountain trails and had reported finding the Kokoda track. This little-known and little-used trail ran from Buna to Kokoda, 
a small mountain plateau on which the Allies had built an airfield, and from Kokoda to a 6,000-foot mountain pass penetrating the otherwise impenetrable Owen Stanleys. On the very day of Hyakutake's arrival, his forward elements had invested Kokoda. Within the next few days, they captured the airfield from an outnumbered force of Australians, and on July 29th, decisively defeated an enemy counterattack. It seemed to Haruyoshi Hyakutake that he might try to invest Moresby from both sea and land. He would send more troops to strike along the Buna Kokoda Moresby axis and mount a fresh seaborne invasion. On July 30th, Vice Admiral Gunichi Mikawa sailed into Simpson Harbour aboard Chokai, and the next day he met with Hyakutake and agreed to the new plan. Ships from Mikawa's 8th Fleet and planes of the 25th Air Flotilla would support the seaborne phase. Some air squadrons now based in New Guinea would be recalled to Rabaul. Nothing was said of Guadalcanal. General Hyakutake, in fact the entire Japanese army, was ignorant of the fact that the Japanese Navy had begun to build an airfield there. General Hyakutake had absolutely no fear of any sizable American counterattack in the Southern Solomons or anywhere else. For this he could not be blamed. The army did not know of the Navy's disastrous defeat at Midway. The generals believed the Navy's falsified claims of victory. Even General Hideki Tojo, the Prime Minister of Japan, though aware of the defeat, did not know the details. Admiral Mikawa did not inform General Hyakutake of the truth about Midway. The Navy could not lose face before the army. So Hyakutake, Mikawa and Admiral Nishizo Tsukahara, commander of 11th Air Fleet, signed an Army-Navy Central Agreement covering the Outer South Seas area. The Navy would continue to be responsible for the defence of the Solomons. General Hyakutake was now free to concentrate on Port Moresby. It was August 2nd and Saburo Sakai and eight of his comrades were flying over Buna at 12,000 feet when Saburo saw five moving specks against the seaward clouds, flying fortresses. Here was Saburo's chance, the chance of all of them to show that a direct nose-on attack could destroy the American bomber that had become the Japanese fighter pilot Scourge. Saburo flew his Zero alongside the plane of Lieutenant Sasai. He pointed to the forts. Sasai nodded. He raised his right hand and rocked his wings. The nine Zeros broke V formation and formed in column. Nine emergency fuel tanks went tumbling through the air. Sakai, Nishizawa, Ota, Yonakawa, Hattori, Endo, all of Japan's leading aces, went into action behind their beloved Lieutenant Sasai. One after another, they made their passes. They selected individual targets, pushed their engines onto overboost, and went roaring at 300 miles an hour toward the fort's nose, triggering cannon shells at the enemy's wing tanks. Saburo could not believe his eyes. The great steel birds seemed to be disappearing in flames. One, two, three. Then, on his second pass, Saburo caught a fort, trying to race away. It was still encumbered by its bomb load. Saburo dove to gain speed. He came up beneath the bomber, angling on its big left wing. He watched his shells exploding, tearing off chunks of metal. Now they were moving toward the bomb bay. The sky became a turbulent sea of blinding white light. Saburo's plane was hurled upward. It flipped over on its back. Saburo's ears rang and his nose began to bleed, and when he looked for the enemy plane, he saw that it had vanished. Groggy but jubilant, Saburo decided that he had hit the enemy's bomb load. Brushing the blood from his lips, he joined Nishizawa in attacking the fifth fort. This, too, seemed to go up in flames. His own plane crippled, a piece of shrapnel in his palm. Saburo flew back to lay and a wild ovation from the ground crews. The mechanics whooped and shouted with glee while Saburo and the others related how they had shot down five flying fortresses in a single afternoon. But they had not. They had shot down only one and damaged another, while losing one of their own pilots. Nevertheless, their elation seized them like a joyous fever, for they sincerely believed that the smoke and flames of American gunfire had been the enemy bombers' funeral pyres. They were irresistible, they thought, the best fighter pilots in the world, and they thirsted for a shot at the American naval pilots whom they had never fought. Next day, they were transferred to Rabaul. On August 6th, Martin Clemens came very close to despair. 
In the past few weeks he had seen the Japanese tightening their grasp on Guadalcanal and heard reports that all the natives had begun to loot the plantations. On August 4th his food gave out, and all that his scroungers could bring to him at his new hideout at Matanga was 75 pounds of stringy yams and a few pumpkins. It was barely enough to warm the bellies of Clemens and his 24 scouts. Nevertheless, it would have to serve to keep them alive for days. On August 5th, the scouts had reported that the airfield was finished. There might be Japanese planes landing on it on Friday the 7th. That, Clemens thought grimly, would just about tear it. It meant that he and Snowy and the others might soon be running for their lives, if not fighting for them. Clemens felt a sudden hot rush of resentment, they had radioed information on every last blasted piece of equipment that the Japanese possessed. And what happened? Nothing. Nothing but a few flying fortresses laying a few desultory eggs and that was all. When would it end? Were they expected to carry on like this forever? Wasn't anybody going to have a go at the Japs? Sitting glumly on his bedroll, Clemens was roused from his gloom by the appearance in the hut of his cook Michael. The man put the last of Clemens's ration a plate of yams, before him. Massa, Michael said gently, you sick too much. More better you Kai Kai, you know Kai Kai all day. Which way me Kai Kai, Michael? Clemens burst out. Belly belong me all the same bugger up. Instantly ashamed of his petulance, struggling against breakdown, Clemens pushed the food away. He turned his face down on his bedroll and let the clamour of a flooding river swell in his ears like the rising roar of doom. The bombers which Clemens missed so bitterly over Guadalcanal were the flying fortresses of Colonel Blondie Saunders' 11th Bombardment Group. They were based on Espiritu Santo in the New Hebrides, about 600 miles to the southeast. If Clemens could have known what had kept these bombers away, he would have joyfully forgiven them. The forts had been flying daily over 1,600 miles of open water, searching for enemy ships, especially aircraft carriers which might endanger the vast American convoy stealing up on the Solomons. On the 6th of August, bad weather had grounded both Japanese and American planes. On that day, Brigadier General William Rose, Colonel Saunders and all available hands worked for 20 hours in a driving rainstorm, forming a bucket brigade to put 25,000 gallons of gasoline aboard the forts that would fly tomorrow, rain or shine, to support the Guadalcanal invasion. It was getting to be dusk of the 6th of August, and a quiet was coming over the ships. Throughout the day, the men had been preparing for battle. The winches had been started and the hatches thrown open. On the artillery transport, 75 or 105 mediameter howitzers were hauled aloft and trundled to the gunwales. Coils of rope for towing them inland were looped about their stubby barrels. Winchmen on the assault transports brought boxes of ammunition, mortar shells, spare gun parts, and roll after roll of barbed wire on deck. Everywhere was the spluttering sound of landing boat motors being tested. Their coxswains, many of them from the Coast Guard, stood at the throttle even as these low wooden craft were unlashed and swung out on davits. The skies were overcast, the air moist and sticky. Sweat oozing from the bodies of men at work made dark patches on the Marines' pale green twill dungarees and blotched the sailors' light blue shirts. Tension made the sweat come faster, and the strain seemed more evident on the faces of the sailors. They had been inclined to belittle their passengers. They had scoffed at these foot sloggers who lived like cattle in stifling holds, sleeping on five-tiered mats with their packs for pillows and their noses but a few inches beneath the bulkheads or the bunks above. Sailors accustomed to regular meals and quarters with individual bunks, clean linen and fresh water could not help but feel superior to men who took saltwater showers and ate on their feet in steaming, pitching mess halls, where the decks were slippery with sweat and spilled coffee, and the food was a kind of tasteless though sanitary swill. But now, on the day before the battle, the sailors saw the marines sharpening bayonets and knives, inspecting grenade pins and canteens, blacking rifle sights or applying a last light coat of oil to rifle bores. They saw machine gunners carefully folding long 250 round belts of ammunition in oblong green boxes, or men of their own navy doctors and pharmacists mates of the medical corps checking the kits and medications with which they expected to bind wounds and perhaps save lives during the morning S fight. Seeing this, the sailors felt a sudden humility. 
They felt that they and their ships were secondary, and that the true purpose of the war was to get these men to battle, to bring them to the beaches where the width of a shirt rather than of a ship's armour plate stood between them and the enemy's steel. The marines themselves were in a mood of sardonic gaiety. They listened for the last time to officers gravely informing them that the Japanese soldier was the greatest jungle fighter in the world, a strong, cruel stoic who tortured and killed in the name of an emperor he believed to be divine, a superman able to subsist on a handful of rice while marching farther and enduring more than any other soldier in the world. Because these marines had heard this hysterical hokum since it began after Pearl Harbor eight months ago and had finally tired of it, they began to crack jokes or to interrupt the speakers. Hey, Lieutenant, a freckled southerner on the Elliot called. Ah, Neva heard tell of Japs living in jungles. Ah, thought most of them was city slickers like the Yanks here. Yavo, Jogia, Johnny Rivers boomed. But we won't have to coax the monkeys out of the trees with corn pone like we did you. A fresh burst of laughter was silenced by the impersonal voice blaring from the ship's bullhorn. Darken ship. The smoking lamp is out on all weather decks, all troops below decks. Aboard all the troop ships, the men went below. They descended to holds far below the waterline, the Catholics to go to confession and the Protestants to chaplain's services, others to write the last letter home, and some to lie fully clad on their bunks alone with their reveries or their forebodings. In the heads, where the air was blue with tobacco smoke and loathsome with the reek of human refuse, the showdown games were being held between the lucky or skilful hands into which most of the money had finally settled. Hundreds of dollars would be bet upon the flip of a single card, and when the games ended, the winners would either send the money home via the ship's post offices or stuff it into money belts bought in San Francisco against just such eventuality. Up on American Legion's officer's deck, Colonel Leroy Hunt entertained his officers with a stylish buck and wing, singing his own accompaniment in a deep bass voice. Hunt commanded the 5th Marines. Like Colonel Cates, he was a distinguished veteran of the fighting in France in World War I, having also been wounded twice, gassed once, and been awarded a half-dozen medals. Hunt's 5th Regiment would lead the assault on Guadalcanal next day, with Cates's 1st Marines coming in behind him. It was almost dark now. Major General Vandergrift stood at the rail of Macaulay, peering into the gathering gloom. Vandergrift was relieved. They had been able to come up on the Solomon's back door undetected. Surprise should be his. He would need that advantage, Vandergrift thought, because he expected a hard battle. Nevertheless, he was in good spirits. He had done all that he could, and now there was nothing more to be done. His conscience clear, Archer Vandergrift felt relieved. Suddenly he became aware of the darkness and of his own bad night vision. He called for an officer to assist him to his quarters and sat down to finish a letter to his wife. Tomorrow morning at dawn we land in the first major offensive of this war. Our plans have been made and God grant that our judgment has been sound. We have rehearsed the plans. The officers and men are keen and ready to go. Way before you read this you will have heard of it. Whatever happens you'll know that I did my best. Let us hope that best will be enough. Below decks, the lights were out. All was silent save the throbbing of the ship's motors, the steady breathing of men relaxed in sleep, the quicker gasping of men tense and wide-eyed in the dark. Above, the lights began to go out in the wardrooms. Officers put away their cards and chessboards. Steaming steadily at twelve knots, the invasion force slipped along Guadalcanal's southern coast. In the early hours of August 7th, 1942, the ships were off Cape Esperance at the island's western tip. At two o'clock in the morning, by the light of a quarter moon just then emerging, lookouts on the weather decks could make out the round brooding bulk of Savo Island standing sentinel at the entrance to Iron Bottom Bay. Great grey shapes sliding toward an unsuspecting enemy, the ships entered. They split into two groups. The Tulagi force sailed on the northern side of Savo the Guadalcanal force on the southern, and there was still not a sign from the foe. One hundred miles to the south, Admiral Fletcher's aircraft carriers were turning slowly into the wind. Dauntlesses, Avengers and Wildcats, the great warbirds of the American Navy, all were out on flight decks. No more the Devastator or Vindicator or Buffalo. The Japanese had annihilated them. 
seen to it that they were scrapped and had inadvertently done a great favour for the young men smoking and drinking coffee in the pilot's ready rooms. Outside, the motors were started. Props swung, caught and spun briefly, stopped and caught again while the engines coughed blue smoke. Engines cleared and began idling. Blue halos encircled the cowlings. Each of the carriers, Wasp, Saratoga and Enterprise, might have been marked from the air by those bright blue rings on their decks, but there was no enemy in the sky above them. One hour before sunrise, the great ships began launching. Up at Iron Bottom Bay it was getting daylight and the ships were at their stations. The Japanese were still sleeping. They did not awake until, at 6.13 a.m., the first shells from the cruiser Quincy's turrets hurled America's reply to the nation which had contrived Pearl Harbor. Aboard the ships, Marines were coming up on deck, their bellies full of navy beans and their eyes blinking in the unaccustomed sunlight. F Company stand by to disembark. First platoon stand by to disembark. All right, you men, down them cargo nets. They went over the side. Bandoliers slung crisscross over their breasts, cartridge belts bulging with bullets, carrying machine gun and mortar parts weighing up to 50 pounds or loaded down with automatic rifles, with helmets bumping over their eyes and the muzzles of slung rifles digging into their necks or pistols flapping at their hips. Heavy and awkward with the habiliments of war, they went clambering down the cargo nets. They clung to the coarse ropes with desperately clutching hands, while the movement of the ships banged them mercilessly against steel hulls. They waited like patient armoured ants while man after man let go and jumped into the Higgins boats wallowing below, until, at last, they were all embarked, bayonets were fixed, heads were ducked below the gunnels, and the boats taxied slowly toward the landing circles. And now the iron voices of the bombardment ships were bellowing. Now the six and eight inch muzzles spouted orange. Now great gobbets and gouts of flame and splintering debris shot into the air from the shores of both Guadalcanal and Tulagi. And now columns of black smoke rose into the air, while the Dauntlesses dove and dove relentlessly, and the Avengers skimmed in low. High up at Vungano, Sergeant Major Vuza saw it all and hastened down trail to tell his master. Below him at Matanga, Martin Clemens was on his feet, shouting in exultant joy. He had bounded from his bedroll at the first crash of Quincy's guns, instinctively aware of its meaning, tired no longer, and crowing, Kalu, Calais, oh what a day! Vuza found the district officer crouched gleefully beside a radio crackling with the voices of American pilots spotting targets for the gunfire ships, of others shouting to one another or begging their ships for new missions. One after another the scouts came down from Matanga. Grinning broadly, they related how favourite targets, ones that they had scouted for Clemens and his radio, had gone up in flames and smoke. Out on the bay, the landing boats were fanning out into assault waves, Power was poured to the motors. Sterns dug deep into the waves. Hulls down, white wakes creaming out behind them. The marines sped north and south toward palm-fringed shores. Six hundred miles to the northwest, Vice Admiral Gunichi Mikawa read a message from Guadalcanal. Encountered American landing forces and are retreating into the jungle. And one from Tulagi. The enemy force is overwhelming. We will defend our positions to the death praying for everlasting victory. Reacting swiftly, Admiral Mikawa began collecting ships and men for a counterstroke. Even as the Americans entered the Solomons, the Japanese began preparing to throw them out again. It was at Tulagi that the American counteroffensive began. Minutes after Tulagi radioed its last defiant message, shells from cruiser San Juan smashed the radio shack. Tuyagi was never heard from again. Out in the harbour, men of the Yokohama Air Group frantically sought to save eight blazing Kawanishi flying boats caught on the surface like sitting ducks. A ninth, piloted by Lieutenant Commander Yoshio Tashiro, roared over the water and tried to flounder aloft, only to be tumbled back in flames by San Juan's guns. Commander Tashiro and his roaring tiger belt buckle triplet to the one worn by his brother-in-law Lieutenant Junichi Sasai sank to the bottom of Iron Bottom Bay. Off Tulagi's southern coast, the men of the 1st Raider Battalion were debarking from destroyer transports which had brought them from New Caledonia. Lieutenant Colonel Edson watched them going. Short, wiry, pale and icy-eyed, his eyebrows mere wisps of that carroty red hair which had earned him the nickname of Red Mike, Edson stood with his hands on the butt of the big six-shooter he wore, 
Western style, smiling his cold smile while making sure that the men were stripped down for battle. Don't worry about the food, he told a company commander, fretting about the absence of rations. There's plenty there. Japs eat too. All you have to do is get it. Edson was not leading the attack personally. Lieutenant Colonel Sam Griffith would do that. Griffith was another hard professional, but with an intellectual side. He was a Chinese scholar, a marine who could write as well as fight. Shortly before eight o'clock, with the British residency and other buildings on the southeastern tip enshrouded in smoke, Griffith and the raiders sped for the northwestern end of the little boot-shaped island. At eight o'clock their Higgins boats grated to a halt on coral shoals, and assault riflemen leaped into the surf. They sank into waist-deep water. Many of them floundered beneath heavy loads and went under. Others slipped on slimy coral underfooting and also sank. Yanked to their feet by their buddies, they struggled shoreward. They emerged with blood streaming from hands and knees torn by cruel coral. Fortunately, no enemy fire spat from the jungle and they plunged into its murk. At 8.15 a.m. Griffith signalled, Landing successful, no opposition. Now the raiders moved swiftly. They were two-thirds up the island. They scaled a steep, grim cliff to their front and wheeled right. They drove southeastward along the cliff's spine and sloping sides. Behind them, the 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines, under Lieutenant Colonel Harold Rosecrans, crossed the same landing beaches and swung left. Rosecrans's men were to clear the northwestern third. They struck out quickly and found the territory undefended. They turned again and moved in behind Griffith in support. Throughout the morning, the raiders moved over rough, jumbled ground, working through rocks and trees, keeping clear of shore trails covered by enemy cliffs. At noon, they spilled into the former Chinese settlement on the island's north coast, and there the Japanese struck back. Mortar shells began to fall. Marines toppled. Lieutenant Samuel Miles, a physician, rushed to help three badly wounded men and fell dead, the first casualty of the campaign. A company commander was wounded. The Marines moved more warily against these rickety Chinese shacks, and the tempo of their advance slowed. Late in the afternoon, Edson, who had come ashore, called a halt. The Marines held a line running roughly from Carpenter's Wharf on the north to a small clubhouse south of the residency. It was not really a continuous line, rather a position held by raiders in hastily scooped two or three man foxholes sometimes connected with each other, more often not with the 2nd Battalion 5th backing them up. Red Mike Edson calculated that there were about 300 Japanese defenders in front of his men, and he expected that they would counter-attack that night. Rabaul's counter-attack was already underway. Upon receipt of the Tulagi message, Vice Admiral Gunichi Mikawa had ordered the 25th Air Flotilla to send 24 Betty bombers bound for New Guinea to Tulagi Guadalcanal instead. Then he called in the Tainan Group's fighter leader, Commander Tadashi Nakajima. He showed him the target area. Nakajima was thunderstruck. 600 miles to the target and 600 back. Even if his Zeros could land at Buka on Bougainville on the way back, they would still be flying the longest fighter mission ever. Mikawa did not care. Take every zero that will fly, he said. Nakajima protested. This is the longest fighter mission in history. Not all of my men are capable of making it. Let me take only my twelve best pilots. His eyes blazing, Mikawa shoved the Tulagi farewell over the table. Nakajima read it and stiffened. Very well then. Eighteen zeros for Guadalcanal. Nakajima left the shack and told an orderly to recall the men waiting in cockpits for the New Guinea mission. They came back Sakai, Nishizawa, Ota, Lieutenant Sasai, the best of Japan's aces, and they wondered at the anger on Nakajima's face. Handing out maps of the Solomons, he told them quickly of the American strike. Lieutenant Sasai's face blanched. He stared straight ahead and said softly, My brother-in-law was assigned to Tulagi. Nakajima ignored him and wrapped out the distance to the target. The men gave low whistles of disbelief. Nakajima ignored them too and snapped, We will take off at once for Guadalcanal. The pilots broke up into trios. Saburo Sakai turned to his wingmen, Yonakawa and Hatori. You'll meet the American Navy flyers for the first time today. They are going to have us at a distinct advantage because of the distance we have to fly. I want you both to use the greatest caution, Above all, never break away from me, no matter what happens. 
no matter what goes on around us. Stick as close to my plane as you can. Remember that. Don't break away. Yonakawa and Hattori nodded. Why break away anyway? Saburo Sakai had never lost a wingman. Turning, the three pilots joined the others sprinting for their zeros. They climbed into cockpits and watched two dozen Bettys go thundering down the runway ahead of them. At last, Commander Nakajima lifted his hand over his head. Within ten minutes, all of his fighters were airborne. In Tokyo, reports of the American invasion did not unduly disturb Imperial General Headquarters. Army General Staff's chief reaction was one of surprise to find that the Navy had been building an airfield on this insignificant island in the South Seas, inhabited only by natives. An intelligence report from the Japanese military attaché in Moscow claimed that there were only 2,000 Americans involved, and that they intended to destroy the airfield and withdraw. The enemy operation was nothing but a reconnaissance in force. The report was believed, although both Army and Navy agreed that the Americans should be ousted before they could put the airfield into operation. General Gen Sugiyama, Chief of Army General Staff, spent the morning hunting for a unit to do the job. Admiral Osami Nagano, Chief of Naval General Staff, passed a more active day. First, he had received Admiral Mikawa's radioed request for approval of his proposal to launch a night surface attack against the American fleet. Nagano had been appalled. A night attack in the narrow, uncharted water of the slot seemed too risky. But his staff, arguing that this was a chance to hit the Americans hard, persuaded him to approve Mikawa's plan. He signalled, Execute. Next, Nagano directed Combined Fleet to give first priority to the recapture of Guadalcanal. Admiral Yamamoto immediately set up a Supreme Southeast Area Force and notified Vice Admiral Nishizo Tsukahara on Saipan to take charge of it. Tsukahara, commander of the 11th Air Fleet, quickly made provisions to lead the cream of his command to Rabaul for action next day. Tsukahara now superseded Mikawa. Admiral Yamamoto also began gathering all available ships and planes for a massive sortie. Characteristically, he considered the Solomon's invasion as one more chance to destroy the enemy fleet. It was not Guadalcanal that was important to him. It was the fact that the American Navy was gathered there in force and could be annihilated in decisive battle. Thus, the importance of Guadalcanal to Japan's military leaders, General Sugiyama, echoed by General Hyakutake, thought it a mere nuisance which might interfere with the Port Moresby operation and must therefore be quickly squelched. Admirals Nagano and Yamamoto saw it as an opportunity to regain the naval edge lost at Midway. Nevertheless, Nagano thought enough of the event to report it to Emperor Hirohito. Putting on dress whites, Nagano went to the Emperor's summer villa at Nikko. Alarmed, more prescient than his admirals, Hirohito said he would return to Tokyo. Your Majesty, Nagano protested, it is nothing worthy of your majesty's attention. Nagano showed the emperor the report from Moscow, and Hirohito stayed in Nikko. Gunichi Mikawa was overjoyed to receive naval general staff's order to attack. He had already ordered Rear Admiral Aritomo Goto to sortie from New Ireland with 8th Fleet's big sluggers, heavy cruisers Chokai, Aoba, Kinugasa, Kako and Furutaka, along with destroyer Yunagi. Mikawa intended to board Chokai to lead his force, plus light cruisers Tenryu and Yubari, then in harbour at Rabaul, south to the Solomons. Mikawa had also attended to reinforcements for the Solomons' garrisons. Hyakutake had been of no help, as Mikawa had expected, insisting that he could not spare a man from the Port Moresby operation. So the Admiral had had to scrape up 410 men from the 5th Sasebo Special Naval Landing Force, and from the 81st Garrison Unit. He put them under Lieutenant Endo with instructions to board transport Mayo Maru and sail south for Guadalcanal next day. Mikawa realised that this was not very many men, but he expected them to do some good, for he too believed that there were only about 2,000 Americans to the south. Japanese bombers flying to Guadalcanal from the airfield at Kavieng on New Island usually passed over Buka Passage in the Northern Solomons, where they could be seen by the coast watcher, Jack Red. Bombers flying from Rabol passed over Buen on Bougainville, and there they could be spotted by the coast watcher, Paul Mason. 
At half past ten that morning of August 7th, the bespectacled and benign Mason sat serenely within his palm thatched hut on Malabite Hill and heard the thunder of motors overhead. He rushed outside and counted the Bettys preceding the zeros down to Guadalcanal. He ran back inside and signalled, 24 torpedo bombers headed yours. Twenty-five minutes later, aboard the Australian cruiser Canberra, down at Iron Bottom Bay, sailors heard the bullhorn announce, The ship will be attacked at noon by twenty-four torpedo bombers. All hands will pipe to dinner at eleven o'clock. The Bonza boys up north, as the Australians described their countrymen of the coast watchers, had given the convoy's sailors time to line their bellies for battle, and Admiral Fletcher's fighter pilots time to climb high over Savo Island to await the oncoming enemy.